pew. Taking a sip of coffee. And as soon as the screen switches to the game, we will start. Okay. Hello, my name is Jeff Vogel. I am the president, co-founder, and main developer of Spiderweb Software, a company that I run with my radiant wife, Marianne Krijan. And today and tomorrow, to celebrate the Steam sale, we are going to engage in a grand experiment. We are going to try streaming our games for a bit, which we've never done before. Hopefully I can run a line of patter convincingly for two hours. And what I'm going to try to do is first, you know, sell our game. This game is currently on sale on Steam. But also, you know, we have a lot of fans. People have been our fans for a long time. And this gives us a chance to talk about our games, about our company, what we do, and give kind of a director's cut of um, a director's commentary of our work. So I'm going to start with our most popular game in our most popular series, Avernum 3 Ruined World. We pronounce it Avernum, other people pronounce it Avernum, and such and such. And honestly, we don't care how people pronounce the names of our games. We're just very lucky that anyone's paying the slightest bit of attention to us at all. Okay, so Avernum. I'm going to start the game, and it's we write fantasy role-playing games. Classic, old-school, turn-based, very story-heavy, Ultima-style, Baldur's Gate-style fantasy role-playing games. We started doing this in 1994, and we've basically worked on the same thing ever since. And by the way, if our sound cuts out, if anything becomes weird, please um, tell us in chat. We're keeping an eye on chat, and then if anything breaks, we will scramble to try to get it fixed. Okay, so in Avernum, you start with a three, four-character party for our turn-based adventure, and I don't play our games. Um, once I, when I write a game, I work on it incredibly intensely for about a year, year and a half, two years. And then once it's done, it kind of falls out of my head because I have to make room for the next game. So when I go through this, it's go I'm going to be playing it pretty much as I... Um, as if I've never played it before, because I actually remember very little about this. We've written over 20 games, and I remember very little about each of them, because if they, my brain was full of them all, I would lose my mind. So as you can see, there is a four-person party with four different character classes. I'm not going to mess with the names. I'm not going to mess with the character types, because I always make sure that the default party is very functional. And I'm going to start hacking through this. There's always four difficulties, casual, normal, and then the tougher ones. Generally, like serious role-playing gamers start on hard, but I'm going to start on normal because, as a rule, I am terrible at our games. And now it's going to go through the story. The story is going to go on for a little while. The cutscene for this, su such as it is, is pretty long. Um, so while it goes on, I'm going to tell the story about this game and about its setting. The... Our very first game was called Exile Escape from the Pit, and it is set in the world of exile. And exile is a gigantic country underneath the surface of the Earth. The surface of the world is ruled by the Empire that controls all the known lands. And whenever someone is a misfit, a petty criminal, someone they just don't want around anymore, they get thrown through a portal into the underworld of exile, or in, in this case, Avernum, where they hopefully die peacefully without anyone hearing about them again. So. This is the third game in the series. I wrote three games, Exile, Exile 2, and Exile 3. A few years later, I remastered them into Avernum, Avernum 2, and Avernum 3, and then about a decade ago, I started remastering them again until their current forms, which is Avernum Escape from the Pit, Avernum 2 Crystal Souls, and this game, Avernum 3 Ruined World. Now, Exile 3 Ruined World was our first hit in 1997, to the extent that you could have a shareware hit in 1997, but this is far before Steam. This was even barely when there was a World Wide Web. That game has since been remastered twice, and it's been an enormous success for us each time, and this is our most recent entry, the remastery of Avernum, Exile 3, and then Avernum 3 is now Avernum 3 Ruined World. And I'm going to point out right now, no surprises, it's a pretty low-budget game. We, it's, you know, we're a two-person company. We do the very best we can with what we can. And obviously, the graphics are rough. They're low budget. There's lots of little glitches, little bits of missing polish that a real professional quality developer would have put in a long time ago. But on the other hand, some people find appeal in the fact that 
we are just small with no resources and just making the best games we can with what we have. And it ain't much to look at. It doesn't have music. It has its quirks, but I can promise you it's a fun game. At least people have been enjoying the heck out of it for over 20 years. Sip of coffee. Okay. So the storyline is still going on, and basically it has to ex explaining now the entire storyline of two fairly heavy, very long, very story-heavy games to try to catch you up. But what you're basically being told is you're part of this underworld prison, and now you're finally going to try to escape. Your you, your nation was had there were magical wards keeping you from getting back to the surface. Those wards haven't been removed. And those wards have been removed, and now the Avernum is going to send the first group of explorers back to the surface, and those group of explorers are you. So, this is about the beginning of your training and the beginning of your instruction, and then you're going to get your first... I'm, I, playing this, is going to get the first mission, and I'm going to play through a bunch of that to show you sort of the storyline and a bit of how the game plays. And by the way, I am keeping an eye on the chat, so if you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to ask them. I'm having about a 10 second lag, uh, and um, if I see your question, I will answer it the best I can. So we are now in the tutorial because it's a turn-based fantasy role-playing game. There is a certain amount of instruction that needs to be done, and this is it. So you can see my first-person party. Click to move around. You're, there's going to be a lot of text coming up. I'm going to read the important stuff, and some of it I'm going to skip by kind of quickly. As our games tend to not stream very well because watching people read isn't really very interesting. I'm going to try to read as much of it aloud as I need to to give you an idea of what's going on. Your years of, year of tedious service in the Avernite army has finally paid off. You have been chosen on very short notice to join unspecified services and travel to the surface. The surface, out in the sun, you would never dare dream of it. Yet, first, however, you must complete your final training and testing. Happily, some equipment has been left for you. So, this is a standard, very familiar thing for anyone who has played our games. The there's a couple basics you need to know. They're complicated games. You know, they're really old school turn-based role-playing games, and there's a lot of stuff in them. But right now I need to explain the basics, which is inventory management, combat, and spells. Once you have that, you can pretty much get your way through and all the fancy stuff you can figure out later. Right now it's telling me to press the get button to get one of these helmets, which are lit up a little bit because you're standing next to them. Press get. Click on an item or type the letter by it to pick it up. Boom. Now I have a helmet. Click on again to pick it up, and now I'm dragging it around. I'm going to put on my little fellow. This art was, this is the adapted art of adapted art. The original art in Exile for this character was meant to look like me. Um, then it was remastered in a Vernum in a way that still looked like me, and now looks absolutely nothing like me. But once upon a time, this was me. I wish I still had hair that didn't have gray in it. I have picked up a helmet. Now if I go use the door, I will be told the lizard skin helm is crude and dirty, but it might deflect one of the Empire's weapons if you're very lucky. You eagerly look at the door to the north. Time for your elite training. Okay. Oh, in the, at this point, you couldn't in my engines, you could not drag the screen with us yet. So, gonna head north. When you travel up to the surface, you are likely to be attacked by hostile soldiers and beasts. Before you are let above, Vernon wants to make sure you can handle it. We are about to enter combat mode and have a first rinky-dink little fight, which I am hopefully good enough at this game to survive. And then, okay, we're already in combat mode. Combat works in turn-based. Every turn you get some action points, and action points are used to cast spells and to move. So my character just charged straight up into combat where there is a small spider and a bat waiting for me. I have a dagger equipped, but I don't think I have enough action points to reach the spider. So I'm just going to run up to it and hope it doesn't kill me. Okay, I'm going to run up to a bit. I still don't, this is a melee fighter. I still haven't found missile weapons, so I'm just going to run up. When I play through my tutorials, I tend to try to act as dumb as possible just because it's the tutorial and you don't want people to get killed in the tutorial under any circumstances. I know that this character has spells, but right now I'm just going to run up and do stuff. Okay, here. Why not use magic to destroy your foes? This is a mage. The priest will start getting tooltips when someone gets damaged, which I think is going to be very soon. Press this button to cast a mage spell. Well, I'm going to know already 
that I need to move up a little bit, I'm going to press the button to cast a mage spell. What do I got? Bolt of Fire. That's a good classic. Summon a, an enemy to fight with me. And to this is a combat debuff that will curse your enemies when they hit you. I, right now, I'm just going to... Oh, and daze. I can daze the enemies so that they can't attack for a short time. Right now, if I was really worried about taking damage, I'd daze them. But for now, I'm just going to blow up the spider. Okay, it just took a bunch of damage. The spider ran up and bit one of my guys, and now a bat is trying to chew on me. I'm going to damage, attack the damage guy first. Yay, I have killed a thing. Now I'm going to kill a bat. Actually, I'm going to pause. I'm wondering, now I'm just curious if I was smart enough to, now that, now that someone's wounded, have the priest tutorial. So I'm going to pause this character. Pause this character. There we go. You have a wounded character. Now is a good time to try a healing spell. Sure, why not? I'll take your word for it. And these are the priest spells. There are 25 mage spells and 25 priest spells that sh they get parceled out through the game. And then you can find like hidden special secrets that make the spells more powerful and eventually lock new, new activities for them. Let's see. I can heal. I can cure. Nobody's poisoned. There's standard comic deep. De oh, this is a damage spell. That's pretty cool. But I'm, I'm just going to heal a guy. Why not? And I'm going to indulge and blow this guy up. Boom. OK. So now I'm just sort of by myself. Eventually, when a turn ends, Oh, here it is. I, I missed the chill. When no more enemies are visible, you can end combat mode. In in this game, there's generally town mode and combat mode. Town mode is when you move around as a group. You can talk to people, do your shopping. When you meet enemies, it enters combat mode, which I leave by doing that. Okay, now what happens? Since both of the subterranean horrors left for you have been squished, the gates to the north open. Agents from unspecified servants hurry through, eager to throw you into teleporter and send you to Upper Avernum. From there, you'll last be able to step out and... Ah! Oh yeah, the, the tutorials... The cutscene starts again almost instantly. So here at last is the final training cutscene. Some of this is actually kind of funny. Since you've never been on the surface, you don't know what things like. So they're showing you what sunlight feels like by putting fire on you. I've always found this really funny. And now they're going to teach you what surface life is like. This is a tree. What's it for? So a certain amount of what you're going to be doing on, on the surface is coping with the fact that you don't know how anything works because you've lived your whole life in a cave. At last, you're declared ready. You're supposed to go see someone named Anaximander, a name that you're going to hear a lot over the course of the game. You've mentioned this is your most popular game. Is it your personal favorite? I'm asked sometime which of the... God, we've written between remasters and new games, we've written about over 20 games. Which one is my favorite? I mean, you know, my old cranky mercenary voice wants me to say that um, Avernum 3 is our favorite because it made the most money. And actually, Avernum 3 is one of our favorites because it has a lot of really weird, cool, like it has all of the funniest, coolest, weirdest ideas. I should mention, this game is enormous. So, how this game was made was that I wrote Exile and Exile 2, and they were my first games. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and I just was always scrambling around with my hair on fire to try to figure out how to write a game. When Exile 2 came out, it was a big success, and for Exile 3, I was like, okay, I'm going to hit Swing for the Fences. I got some money. I got a little breathing room. I'm going to try to make the coolest game I can possibly make, and so I took months off, and I played every video game I can get my hands on. This was in the mid-90s, and so I was just catching up on all my video games that I had never been playing, like Warcraft and Elder Scrolls and just about any popular game from the mid-90s. And I stole... I always get my... We all stand on the shoulders of giants. I get all my ideas by stealing the best idea from every game I played. And with a Vernum 3, Exile 3, I wanted to make an enormous world. Like a huge world that you could wander around in forever and never see everything in it. And I really despaired with how big this game was when I was making it. But the game is just enormous and full of stuff and tiny towns and side quests and gigantic hidden missions and stuff like that. So I, and it's full of so many things and so many creative ideas. I probably would have to say that this is my favorite game. This is my favorite game just for how proud of it I am, just for how huge it was. The Gene Forge series are my favorite games for innovation because and my current project right now is Gene Forge 1 Mutagen, which is a long overdue remaster of Gene Forge. I'm finally remastering the Gene Forge series. And um, 
I have a great deal of love in my heart for our most recent game, Queen's Wish the Conqueror, which is probably going to be my, maybe in my career, my last all new series. And I've really tried to create something new and different and creative with that. And it, it's a Gene Queen's Wish. I will be screen dreaming Queen's Wish tomorrow and I'll talk about it a lot more. It's a very polarizing series. Some people love it and find it mind blowing. Other people, I changed a lot about how role playing games work in it and, and they hate it. And so I'll be talking a lot about the things people love and hate about that series and what I'm going to change in the, the further games in the series tomorrow. But anyway, back to Avernum 3. It's big. So let's see. So the first thing I'm going to do, and you know, I'm an old school developer, and one of the things I ha always have is save slots. Oh, wow, it's all of my old saved games. Um, let's see, what can I, what can I cancel, what can I copy over without, actually, I'm just going to quick save. That is F3. Okay, I have now quick save. Now if the game crashes or if I screw something up, I won't be host. So one of the things that said in the description is that there was a map here. So I'm going to hit get, an Axamander note. Somebody left a note for me. This button uses an item. Pick up your supplies and see me as soon as possible. An Axamander. You, the surface, side storeroom, supplies for here, and this is where an Axamander is. So right now you're in Fort Emergence, which is the gigantic Avernite Fortress, which is sort of the border between the underworld and the surface world. So I'm going to use this map, and I'm going to find an Axamander to talk to him, because if not, I can never leave the tutorial. But first I'm going to see, is there any loot? Oh, good. Yeah, I'll take money. Money can be exchanged for goods and services. Dried meat, which can heal you a tiny bit, and pants! I mean, obviously the character is wearing pants, uh, but now the, the character is wearing protective pants. The icons in this game do not change as you put on new equipment because it's part of the low, low budgetiness. You leave the guest quarters and begin your exp exploration of Fort Emergence. Everything is new and all of the construction was done very quickly. You hope that a ceiling doesn't collapse on you when getting breakfast. You work for unspecified services and your commander, an ex-commander, is somewhere off to the west. The first step of a long journey. Please save the game. I've already done that. Keep wandering around. Oh, there's a little lizard. Did I? Oh no, it's a cat. I don't remember. I remember so little about this game that some of the things I'm going to do just to just see what happens. What happens if you talk to the cat? It goes hiss. Meow. Hiss. Oh, that's fun. I think there's there are cats in the game that have actual dialogue, but that is not one of them. Okay, I'm in the middle thing. There's guards standing around. Oh, there's a person there. Teresa, you meet a young woman with long dark hair. She is wandering around the main gallery of Fort Emergence in nervous circles. Hello, I'm supposed to meet someone named Denexmander. Yeah, go west. What are you, you seem very uncomfortable. Why? The keyword is covert. I can't, we deal in secrets. If I tell you things, those things are no longer secrets, and you might give them up. Nothing personal. Is that the only reason you're uncomfortable? Oh, I'm supposed to get a bundle of records from the portal for it. It was supposed to get here weeks ago. Oh, it's a mission. That's how you, you can get experience and treasure for that. Okay, I just got one of the many, many side missions in this fort. Okay, I'm gonna open a door. So this is a supply. This is the supply room that was marked on your map. Oh, I see. Oh, there's a thing down here with a sign. Sign, Auxiliary Supply Room. This is what was marked on your map, and I can get more stuff. Yeah, oh, a note was left for me saying that I could I could get things. I just skipped past that, because y you're going to have to tolerate to a certain amount my developer reflexes. I'm After 25 years, I reflexively click through anything with words on it, because I already know what it says, because I wrote it. Uh, but I will. Let's see, I've got a dagger, but here's a sword. I will equip that. You can see that the dagger only does 12 to 36 damage and the sword does 13 to 52 damage, so I'm definitely going to want that. I'll wear chainmail. Uh, this is an iron breastplate. Oh, that's breastplate. That's pretty good. Uh, I have two. I'll put on bracers. Uh, I'll grab a lamp. Why not? Spear. Okay. So the next character is a Slith Zerakai. Mike, I. My games don't have traditional Dungeons and Dragons, Tolkien fantasy role-playing races. I don't have. Oh, if Avernum Three is so big, does it, someone asked a question? If Avernum Three is so big, does that mean four, five, and six are bigger, same size, or smaller? And someone else is asking. Okay, so there's two Avernum trilogies. Avernum One through Three is about the the prisoners, the Avernites, escaping to the surface and finding their freedom. And then partly because I want to tell 
a lot more in this world stories in this world because I love it and partly because I also love money I wrote the second Avernum trilogy Avernum 4 through 6 and that is about the future of Avernum after a, a lot of people in Avernum leave to go to the surface and a bunch of them stay behind it's the story of how Avernum survives and struggles and the final fate of Avernum so it's a whole new series of games a whole different engine a different setup they're pretty cool games. They sold quite well. They are also immense games. Nothing we've done is as big as Avernum 3, but Avernum 4 through 6 are huge. And someone asked if we're planning to remaster them. The answer is yes, but not for a long time. Between writing new Finish the Queen's Wish, Wish series and remastering the Gene Forge games, that's going to be a project of five, six, seven years. Once that is done, we're going to go remaster Avernum 4 through 6, which would be pretty cool. Let's see. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. I would love an Avernum setting as a campaign in D&D. Sometimes people ask if we're going to take our games and license them and have novels or movies or stuff like that. And the answer is probably not because we are so small. We are a small, negligible country company. Big companies don't even know we exist. Okay, so back to the races. We don't have elves, we don't have dwarves, we don't have hobbits. We always make up, roll our own weird fantasy series, fantasy creatures. And in Avernum, the main ones that you play are the Nephilim and the Slicericae. Nephilim are cat people, Slicericae are lizard folk. And they each have their own cultures, their own temperaments, Oh, they each have their own cultures, their own temperaments, and um, I won't go into that in great length, except to say that that is why you're looking at a lizard guy. But one of the things with the lizard guys is they get a bonus when using pole weapons, so I'm going to do that. Might as well give him indulge in giving him armor. He can't use a shield because he's using a spear, but he can wear a hat. He can wear lizard pants, and I, since it looks like I have a good shield, I'm going to see this guy has a sword, and we have him a shield too. Now we should be able to survive the first fight. I'm going to quick save again in case I accidentally get myself killed. There's a bunch of bags there. They probably all these bags probably contain stuff, but I'm not going to sort through stuff. I noticed that this these pot, pots are a little bit misplaced in their tile. They should be a little bit higher. It's amazing how I can work through a year a game like this for a year and a half and not have the slightest bit of fit and finish in the game. Thank you for giving us money, despite our incredible multitude of flaws. Oh, I see. So someone comments, there is a long steam review by Sean of Vernum 3 Ruined World. He basically says he prefers the original of Vernum 3. And I, you know, I'll comment on that, because why not? Whenever you change things, people will not like the thing you change it to. This is not because they are wrong, it is just because people have taste. If Avernum 3 was your perfect game, Avernum 3 Ruined World is not going to be your perfect game because it is different. When I change things, I really honestly try my best to make it a better game in the sense that it will bring as mo much pleasure as possible to the maximum amount of people. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. Some Sometimes I make changes that I, for my personal tastes, think are good, and then when I make those changes, other people don't like them as much. I still prefer them, but if you don't like a change I made, dear lord, you know, that's, that's your right. It's like, for example, these games used to have item identification. Exile Exile 3 had, had an item identification. We got a magic item in the dungeon, you had to take it back and pay a dude, you know, some pocket change, and they told you what the item is. I don't like that. I don't... Um, I think that's just a waste of time. I think it's irritating, and for people who weren't really used to role-playing games, it was a disaster. They, they, I would like get emails like, I'm finding so many magic items, I don't know what they do. And I'm like, didn't you know about identification? They're like, bah. So that was a rough edge I rounded off. And some people don't like their rough edges rounded off. And again, that is a legitimate taste. It's just, I've been writing games for 25 years, my tastes evolve, and I remove things that get on, get on my nerves. Um, Someone is, I know. Okay, I just looked at comments. Yeah, it does look kind of Charles Dance. It's not a. It's it. It was not intentional. That's just a serendipity. Okay, so I finally found an Anaximander's lair, and you have been 
Gridden, you have been greeted with a with a gigantic wall of text because our games are very reading heavy, which is again why they tend not to be very streamable. I'm going to betray. I'm going to give the game away by not reading all of this text out loud. Some people like my writing, uh, so, and I have my moments, but I'm probably gonna. My voice had give out. You enter a large, cramped, dimly lit office. It is filled with stacks of paper, maps, plans, barely legible notes, and the like. It also contains many plates and mugs, all in need of washing. In addition to all the other clutter, you find a small ratty man whose clothes and hair are in extreme disarray. This is not terrible writing. I could cut a few words out of this, but I think it paints the picture pretty well. He twitches constantly with nervous energy. When you enter, he leaps up and rushes over to greet you. I'm glad I painted this character pretty well because this guy is kind of your quest hub. If you ever get lost, you can always come back to talk to this guy and he'll tell you where to go. Greetings, my friend. I'm so glad you're finally here. I'm an Axemander, as Commander Johnson commands the military half of the fort. I run the somewhat uh, more covert operations. His words pour out in a babble. I will be the person you report to for further instructions during explorations of the surface world. When you do something, come to me. When you don't do something, come to me. When you're just plain confused, come to me. Doop. He returns to a seat. Oh, God, more words. And sorts through papers, looking for something. He can't find it. Damn, I had a map to a nearby goblin outpost. There's a bandit lair, too, in the caves. We thought you might want to do some raiding there to learn to work as a team and pick, pick up some loot before exploring the surface. There's a map to the goblins around here somewhere. Search a bit. When you're warmed up and ready to explore the surface, come back here. I'll have more instructions. Remember to go to Upper Avernum, leave Fort Avernus to the south. To go to the surface, leave to the north. He nods, flashes you a worried grin, and goes back to his notes. Now, I might poke my head out to the surface for a bit so that everyone can see green for a minute, but the game pushes you very hard to explore the underworld a little bit first. That is where kind of the low end tutorial stuff go. The high, the monsters in the upper world are are quite a bit tougher. So I actually, I think I might indulge and ignore my warning and try to go out on the surface world now and see what happens. Because now I'm kind of curious. I know the game's going to like poke you in the eye, but I'm not sure if it'll actually slaughter you. Don't forget, the sooner you go out onto the surface and see what's going on, the better. All of Vernum waits to see whether it is safe to emerge. He gives you a pair of maps, one of Upper Avernum and one of the surface lands around Fort Emergence. Press the world map button to see the surface and Avernum maps. Okay, so I think it mentions sometimes that if you press tab, it, no, no, it doesn't. Okay, where's the world? Map of Avernum. Okay, so there is... Oh, God, the button is hanging off the screen. I'm such a terrible, terrible developer. Anyway, because I'm in Upper Avernum, it is showing you the map of Upper Avernum. When you're on the surface, it'll switch to showing you the map of the surface. But you can click and you select map, and now I'm switching the maps. Oh, man, it is so embarrassing seeing seeing these bugs. Also, why is that? Oh, I know why that's green. Is that screwed up? Should that be green? Oh god, I'm such a bad developer. The, the newer games have more bugs. This is our this is our flagship product, by the way. This is our flagship product. So I hope you enjoy these Persian flaws. I hope you enjoy the little bit little fun rough edges you get from <laughs> from a large triple A sized game written basically by one dude because the, the the edges are rough. Okay, so anyway. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, so this is Northern Valorum, which you have never visited and you won't visit for a long time. This is Southern Village. Valorum. Fort Emergent, Crijan Province, who is named after my wife, Marianne Crijan. We were just going out, but not yet married when I decided to write, decided to, um, to name a huge amount of the game after her, just as the sort of warm, warm gesture that I'm known for. Okay, so he told me to look for a little map. I'm going to quick save. Toink! I'm hitting F3 for that. I walk in the room, and immediately there's a piece of paper. I look at the piece of paper. Bandit map! Okay, so now you can see a chunk of Fort Emergence. Oh, it's interesting that it's drawing these green. It's like the the transparency is off. I wonder if that's happened happened since I switched to Windows 10. It might also just be a glitch on my computer. Uh, my computer has shown some graphics quirks. Anyway, anyway, it's something for me to do the next time I update this game. Lol. So Fort Emergence. And you can see that there's the portal for it. This is how you return back down to Avernum. There is so much story in this game, I'm not going to get into it. But there's a layer of goblins, and there's a layer of bandits. So one more thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go get a side quest. If memory serves... Yeah, since I don't remember seeing the rain. No, no, it's definitely a glitch. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think it is a glitch on my... Just on my machine. Oh, I looked at a map. There's like a little... Oh, the sign says, emergency water storage. No swimming, no spitting. This means you. 
It's just a bit of bit of whimsy. Now, there's a guy near here named after named Commander Johnson, who's named after one of my dear friends from when I was a teenager. Almost everyone in these games is named after somebody I know, a tradition or, that I continue to this day. Although there's also, I had to name like a hundred towns for this, and occasionally I got really, game, and I got, once I got really whimsical, there are coasts, there are two cities in the very, very remote section that are named Lennis and Squigus, after characters in a 1970s sitcom, which most of my fans are too young to have ever seen. Okay, so there's a guy here in big imposing armor. Commander Johnson, you approach a gaunt, severe man with a regal bearing and cruel eyes. His armor bears the insignia of a commander. When you approach, he is eating stew and dry bread. At first, you think he doesn't notice your presence. Then he motions with his hand for you to join him. He looks across the table at you with detached interest. I'm Commander Johnson. You are the secondary surface crew, yes? I think you can be useful to us if you want. You call us the secondary surface crew? So th that leads to a whole storyline, which I'm, I'm not going to get into. Commander J Johnson is a character in all of the Exile games, noted for his passionate desire to, pr to, to, to murder everybody that seems like even the slightest threat to Avernum. He's like, I could be useful to you. I could use some experience. Hey, I can follow a trail of breadcrumbs when they're thrown on my face. Well, there is something so negligible I don't want to waste my people's time on it. A tribe of goblins have settled into a warren not far from here, in Upper Vernum. They haven't caused us trouble yet. They will soon. Break in and kill your, their chief. That should disperse them for a while. Uh, how do you know they have a chief? They always do. Okay. Quest received. The goblin chief. So now I have a mission that will get me experience and treasure and give me something to play through for the remaining hour and a half of this stream. First, I'm going to quick save. I'm going to see if it's going to let me out of the north gate. So I can look at the surface for a second and see what happens if I'm impatient, impetuous. Oh, there's little. The way is protected by a lava pool. An arrow bridge arcs over it. Well, that's not really a bridge. It's a raised bit of floor, but I am not a, I am not a good developer. It's the surface. You emerge from Fort Emergence into the outdoors. A harsh yellow light from above blinds you. So you're front, I'm going to take a moment and see if this is still recording. Okay, it's still recording. Wow, I bet this is going to be a large, large file. By the way, so I've been having some internet wonkiness, so I'm only playing this at 1024 by 768. You emerge from, you can, this game supports huge monitors. You emerge from Ford Emergence into the outdoors, a harsh little yellow light from above blinds you. The air smells strange for a while. The size and openness of the blue space above you paralyzes you with vertigo. Still, there is nothing to do but press on. Oh, God, I love words. You emerge from the valley and are immediately greeted by a view which brings tears to your eyes. It has been many years since the Vernites have seen the surface. Those of you who have seen it at all. And after years of dreaming here, it finally is laid out before you. Plants are everywhere. You feel the wind and the sky is a blue richer than any you've ever seen. It's warm and dry and there can be no doubt you are finally home. You stand there for an hour, just admiring the sights and feeling the sensations. Then you look around more carefully. This area is unsettled. There's a river to the south, but there are no human settlements as far as you can see. This is excellent news. Not only is Fort Emergence under no immediate danger of attack, but there is plenty of room around here for Vernites to settle. Now, this is a major, major plot point, because remember, the surface is ruled by the Empire, and it hates you. So now you know that the world is big, and you're looking around and you're not seeing any empire, so there may be a place that you can flee to. Everything seems great. Everything's good. Did you, the, the world the world has, is the world is yours. You've won. But it wouldn't do to get too excited. There's still plenty to be discovered and plenty of, it to, of investigation to do. You'll have to meet the surface people, who are likely to be very different from you. Also, while there is great joy in leaving the caves, it's far more frightening than you thought it would be. After years of tunnels and shadows, the open sky and bright sun leaving you feel constantly blinded and exposed. So th that does not have any gameplay meaning. There's no, like, statistic penalty for being in the sun. A lot of what the flavor and feeling of the game is conveyed through text, and I enjoy that because I'm old. A new chapter in the life of Vernum has just begun. A new landing awaits you. It's time to explore. I think that will be the last wall of text for a while. Doit. Oh, no, there's more words! What What on earth? Starting out at the... Staring out the open unknown terrain around you starts to make you feel nervous. You wonder if you're sufficiently experienced. Oh, okay, this is optional. You wonder if you're sufficiently experienced to handle the threats ahead. You start to consider returning to Upper Vernum to hunt easier foes for a while before risking the surface. It is your decision to make, but the danger ahead is great. To reach Upper Vernum, go back to Fort Emergence and leave it to, to the south. Nah, I feel good about. I feel good about it. I mean, I'm going to quick save just for just for prudence' sake. But still, the surface is still something in the game that's going to make you earn a little bit. Okay. Ooh, ooh. Oh, someone just asked, are you a dungeon master? As a matter of fact, I am. I am... Um 
I started playing tabletop Dungeons and Dragons in 1980. I have been, and I immediately became a dungeon master. I've been playing tabletop role playing games for literally 40 years. I um, I love to dungeon master, but I haven't done it in a long time. And the simple reason is this: dungeon mastering is now my job. Um, you know, making adventures is my job. So trying to make adventures myself for recreation, I have absolutely no interest in doing that. It would hurt my brain too much because all of my role-playing creativity goes into making stuff to sell. That being said, I'm in a D&D group where I've been talking with the DM and I may run a pre-packet um, for our D&D group. I may spend a couple weeks running the very first D&D module I ever owned that I got in 1980, the classic B2 keep of the Borderlands and give everyone a proper retro D&D experience. Let's see. Oh, ooh, can I ask you a question? I'm curious about the Nephilim name. As cat people, when it tends to be a giant antediluvian race from mixed angel-human stock. Okay, someone asked where the Nephilim got their name. And the answer is it is, he, he seems to be asking is it related to um, mythology or to a biblical, the answer is it's a biblical quote. At one point in the Old Testament, the Bible refers to the Nephilim, the huge creatures of old, and that's all that is referred to, the, that is the only reference to them. And people have theories about who they are, what tribe they were meant to represent in the book, but I was just incredibly enchanted But you know, as, as I, I write fantasy for a living, and you can't read something like that without being unbelievably enchanted so um so basically i just lifted the name let me be clear whatever the bible was referring to i'm 90 percent sure it's not um it's not it's not a uh, not cat people but that's that's what i did so um i'm wondering if i should test to see if this is recording properly but i think i'm just going to take a risk and and not do it and said, I'm going to keep playing the game. Okay, so it looks like there's some wandering monsters there. Oh my god, oh, it's not even going to let me get to the crazy stuff. I'm immediately getting attacked. Well, sure, why not? And I am in a fight, and I'm being attacked by unicorns. You know, you can see these are unicorns. They're small, they're green, and unicorns are just horrifyingly annoying pests. They're like just basically rat things, and you're encouraged to wipe them out whenever you can. I believe that in other mythologies, unicorns have a different purpose, but in in um, Avernum, you do this to them. Yay, I killed one. My, ah! It just hit me. Oh. Huh. Wow. Wow. Um, okay, one of your characters has been knocked unconscious. This happens when your health level reaches zero. So, I actually don't have a good feeling about this. I've been encouraged uh, by Herazod, who I believe I know in real life, to run. You can escape a battle by getting up to here. But, you know, to, to be perfectly honest, I did just kill one of them. And these people, my characters are a priest and a wizard. A I mean, warriors are just warriors, but I bet that a, a priest with the power of the gods is totally going to be able to kill one of these things. Okay, see, so I just used a smite spell, and now the wizard is going to summon a mighty bolt of fire. Actually, I'm going to daze them. I'm going to try to slow them down a little bit. There, okay, three other days. Okay, one of them moves up. Okay, but you see, three of these are dazed, so they can't fight anymore. So now I can just totally kill this one. And I'm going to do it with a smite spell. And again, I must stress, I am calling down the power of the gods. So there's no way a bunch of pests like this have any chance to stand against me. Um, by the way, there are hotkeys I could be programming. That's fine. Oh, okay. So you see that, um, okay. So that was a little bit of a, of, of a hitch in my plan. So that's okay. I can totally kill this one. Okay, good. Things are great. So these guys are no longer dazed. Uh, let me see how I'm doing. Okay, so I'm pretty damaged, so I'm actually I'm going to heal myself. Okay. So, alas, your quest to save the surface and win freedom of, of for Vernum has come to a gruesome end. Your bones eventually lie in an anonymous crypt along all of the other victims of the war to come. Fortunately, there is still hope. There are still many scouts and spies in Avernum yearning to infiltrate the surface and win a new homeland. Any one of them could be the new surface of the underworld. Perhaps your next attempt will end in success. There's only one way to find out. So, that's unfortunate. I actually, I forgot that those guys were there. I would have liked to get to a fight with the slimes, which tells you a lot more about the actual plot of the game. But instead, I'm going to load my quick save. 
and run! Oh, for the love of God, run away! Okay, <laughs> I guess I, I I think I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go out the the south gate like everyone was telling me to. Yet goblins. They told me that there was a quest to kill goblins. Okay, so now I'm in the underworld. Here is Fort Emergence. There's a river. You see, everything looks all cavey now. Oh, I thought it let you explore more of the un upper world. Okay, so look, there's dudes. I hope they don't kill you. the fort near Road. Of Fort Emergence is patrolled by a band of Avernite soldiers. They don't seem very alert. They don't need to be. If a serious attack ever comes, it won't be from this direction. When they see you, they march towards you. It looks like they want to talk to you. So I just run away from them like a weirdo, or I'll approach and talk to them. The guards approach you eagerly. You're the surface exploration crew. Have you been to the surface yet? You say that you have. What's it like? They're desperately eager to hear news of what it's like up there. Do you indulge them? So I have been to the surface. Not for long, but I go. I'm going to tell them what it's like. You tell them a few things about what it's like on the surface. The, their overwhelming desire to hear what you've seen is flattering and also a little sad. They're desperately eager to return to the surface where they can be instantly impaled by unicorns. After a while, you accuse yourselves and move on. If you didn't, they would keep asking you questions for hours. They march away quickly, eager to pass on the choice gossip they've obtained. This early on is a really nice bit of um, power fantasy. I really do enjoy giving the player as quickly as possible. Just, you know, you're heroes. At some point, you don't want to feel like a loser. At some point, you want to feel like a hero. And so I, I try to give you a little bit of that earlier. Plus, you are heroes. You know, you're risking your life uh, running around and fighting dudes and getting stabbed and stuff. So every once in a while, people should be nice to you. On a large rickety bridge built to carry troops and oh, this is just a description. Who cares? I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a fight. Time is time is moving on. Uh, oh look, there's some people on the road. I'm gonna have a quick save. And I'm gonna go talk to them. I wonder if they'll be friends to me. Since I'm such a hero, I'm sure that they will be unconditionally supportive in my efforts to let them return to the service. Okay, uh, I'm gonna look. For, take a moment to look at questions. Uh, here is an excellent question. Are these dungeons procedurally generated, or did you handcraft all of them? Oh, someone already answered. Handmade. Yes. Um, so procedural generation is an enormous thing. Like this is this game came out around the time that Diablo did. So um, procedural generation was really starting to take off. I don't care for procedural generation. It is not what we sell. The spite with Spiderweb software, our big product is. Um, our product is me, is my creativity, is handcrafted dungeons, which I make to be quirky and interesting. And you, you've probably noticed going on that there's a lot of text, a lot of flavor, a lot of lore, a lot of humor, a lot of quirks in what is going on. And um, you can't do that procedurally. It is impossible to procedurally create humor unless you're laughing at the procedural generation for coming up with something that's really super goofy. The, and, you know, not to rag on what other developers are doing. Procedural generation can create remarkable, remarkable things, but that's just not what we sell. I try to make it, this game is full of a million dungeons, and I try to make every dungeon have something unexpected, something odd, something that, that, that shakes you and makes you go, huh, I wasn't expecting that. And um, that's, that's the product we sell. And... Um, you know, when you're a small indie developer like us, especially with a with an obscure low budget project, you have to find something that you can do well and make it good. So I'm going to walk up here. Oh, they're running away. Well, they move randomly along the road. So I'm going to move a little bit closer. And I say, oh, let's see. At first, these men look like traveling merchants, perhaps bringing goods to Fort Emergence. When they get close and draw their weapons, however, you realize that they are bandits. There is about a dozen of them. The, their leader says, well, now, if it isn't an adventure, and not just any old adventure either, but the heroic surfaces explore, he's already heard of you. Like, and that's not a surprise. Like, you're going to the surface is big news. Gossip spreads. I always make sure that gossip spreads about you in my games, that gossip spreads ahead of you, just because um, it's more fun when people have heard of you. Gossip about your arrival must have gotten around. Well, since you're so mighty, you can surely spare a few coins to help out a few lowly travelers. Yes, the tone of his voice indicates that refusal to help will be greeted with open hostility. This group of bullies looks pretty tough. You doubt you'll be able to beat them in a fight for now. Yeah, there's a dozen. You can't win this fight. This is just an earlier bit of annoyance I throw in your way that there's just a bunch of jerks out on the road. They're, these guys are jerks. But they're, they, they, you know, they're they're bullying jerks, and so you, you have to give them some money. Thank you, my adventure, and good luck on the surface. We're in good hands. The bandits laugh and move on. So yeah, eventually you gain enough strength to go back and trash these bozos. And of course, you can avoid them easily by staying away from the road. Oh, there, I put a little pool there. It looks different. You walk up to it. As you walk to this near dark green pool, you notice 
bright motes of light floating on the surface. They jump and dance, beckoning you closer. Approach and investigate. Okay, so this is a thing that I just put really close. A lot of people will miss it. If you, if, if you don't miss it, you might run away because you've already been mugged. If you come close, it says, weapons drawn, you carefully approach the glowing water. As you do, the lights rise up off the water and form into some sort of shape. It is humanoid, but so faint and unstable, you can't make out the species. When it is formed, it speaks. I tell you I know of you. I send warning. You are sent, but it is futile. Others are ahead of you to destroy, but I can still give you this gift in hope for you. The shade waves its hand and you feel an odd tingling feeling, then it disappears. This is uh, just a little bit of a breadcrumb to indication that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on beyond, you know, just going out and exploring. And of course, duh, it's a role-playing game. It's going to have a plot, but I like just a little bit of intrigue and let you know stuff's going on. Okay, so I get over here. There's like a little spike pillars if i looked at i looked at a map i saw this about where the goblin lair was so i'm going to quick save and i'm going to go down into the goblin lair this corridor stinks the bones and trash scattered everywhere are clear signs to your keen adventure senses there is a goblin infestation nearby so one of my things that i always do with my game i don't tend to dislike the idea of races that are all evil or all good um again there are some people who have a problem with that politically i kind of i kind of don't um, sometimes, you know, if you, if it, it's fantasy, if you want to have a race and they're just evil, like demons or orcs or whatever, I don't have a particular problem with that, but I tend to find it more fun to, to make sure that, that, you know, any, any species you come across can be interesting and complex and you can talk to them and stuff. But every once in a while for my games, I like to have a little bit of shorthand. Every once in a while, I don't want the player would have to think about, are these guys good? Are these guys bad? What are they, what are we going to do? And so there are a couple races in my games that are always, you're, you meet them, you're always going to fight. Goblins are in most of my games. If you meet goblins, you're about to have a fight. Goblins are just jerks. Um, ogres are always jerks. Uh... I'd have to think for for other species that I have always be bad. In the Queen's Wish, there are creatures called Mirelings and Mire Boars. Spoiler warning: If you meet Mirelings, you're going to be in a fight. Uh, so in this case, there's a goblin infestation nearby, and so that means I'm about to go in. Anyway, Captain Johnson always already told me to fight the goblins, and he was always right about everything. And look, there's goblins. I'm going to quick save again. And then we have to, as you wend your way through the tall stalagmites, choking this tunnel, you freeze. Guttural grunting echoes you from just ahead. Blah, 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 there's goblins. So I can choose to not get in the fight, but then I can't get in the dungeon, so I'm going to get in a fight. Okay, let's see how hard... Yeah, oh my god, there's a lot of them. I hope they're, I hope they're, they're easy. Maybe I should have gotten a missile weapon. Uh, so let's see. I do have battle disciplines, though. I have well-aimed blow and flawless shot. So I'm going to run up, and I'm going to use a battle discipline. So because... Of the, you notice that I'm kind of having trouble scrolling sometimes. That's because I'm playing with a tiny, tiny window on a very, very big monitor. On your machine, you should not have any problems. Warriors have battle disciplines, which give your abilities attacks extra buffs. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to run up, and I'm just going to clean that guy's clock. I'm going to run up. I'm going to do the same thing with this warrior. This character's combat skills aren't high enough for you to use any battle disciplines. How? Unfortunately, I'm just going to hit this wolf with a stick with a, with a pointy stick. Okay, I hit with a lot, but he's still alive. That's kind of a pity. He's going to run up. I wonder if blessings are any good. I'm going to run up here. I cast protection to shield us. Hooray! We're all safe. Now, you can see his spell points get down. Spe casting spells uses up spell energy. Returning to town restores it. Spell energy is really such a poetic word for it. And once again, I'm going to be lame and not hotkey this spell, even though I'm going to cast it 50,000 times. And I've killed two, two fellows. Yikes! Oh, they're pummeling me. Look at that. Look at all that damage. Good lord. God, I'm so bad at this game. Okay, so I'm going to start whittling, that, whittling away at these goblins. Thwack. Good. That was good progress. Uh, I'm going to whack this goblin. Pow. Okay. Dead guy. That did a lot more damage because spears do more damage, but then you can't use a shield. And now we're going to start tossing out the healing. You're going to find this game is fairly tricky early on. You have to be pretty careful until you start gaining your levels. Like, I'm probably going to go have to go back and rest pretty soon, but I, this fight will be on forever, and I'll be able to get in the dungeon, which is actually a bit easier. This is our first real fight, and it's, um, you know, it's kind of tricky. I mean, I'm going to win because I do know how to balance a game, but, um, okay, do I want to, yeah, I'm going to heal. I'm going to play it safe. <laughs> I have got to hotkey this thing. Okay. 
We're making progress. Miss. Hit. Miss. Kill that guy. Kill that guy. I'm going to engage in an indulgence and program a hotkey for the spell that I use every single time. You'll note that my party is in kind of the classic role-playing tank, DPS, healer, caster. There's actually a fair amount of freedom in this game to make different character builds. Um, I've been told... In general, four warriors is never going to succeed, but there are ways to build a four mage party that can really kick some butt. Oh no, I'm gonna I'm gonna program a hotkey. I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend just for a second I'm a real person. I'm 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 a real boy. Hit. Right, we did it. Okay, I can get stuff to thing to sell. Thing to sell. Stick. Not very useful. Crude Dagger, already have a bunch of those. I'm just going to leave that stuff behind. And then to end combat, I'm going to press end combat. And I'm going to quick save. Boit! Okay, I'm going to look for questions. Uh... Oh, nobody has any questions. Everyone's just, ch just chatting. Oh, someone commented, bears are always jerks. Yes, bears will always attack you. And in this game, there is a race of intelligent bears called the Irsagi. Um, but once that they will always attack you. If they meet the Arsagi, they're going to you're about to be in a fight because bears are godless killing machines. I'm gonna run up and enter a dungeon. <gasps> okay, so I'm doing okay. Everyone's healed up and we still have a fair amount of magic energy left. I balance it so if you're good and careful, you can probably get through the whole dungeon on one run. Goblins are one of the great menaces of Avernum. These vicious, wily creatures have a skill for going wherever humans do and causing all kinds of trouble when they get there. Some goblins have occupied this cave not far from Fort Emergence, and your base hasn't been able to spare the resources to uproot them. You might be able to do your superiors a favor, which I already know because I was already given a mission. So you can see there's skulls on posts and skulls on the wall and skulls on the floor. Uh, but it looks like there might be some useful items here that uh, were just picked off a of dead people. So we see on ground, skulls, lots and lots of skulls. But if I scroll down, I can see, okay, crude spear, I think I already have one of those. Wooden shield is not as good as a bronze shield, but there are gloves. So I'm gonna pick up a dead dude's gloves and put them on. So now my, oh wait, is that good? My bronze bracers have 6% armor. Oh wow, the braces are actually a lot better. So I'm gonna take the gloves and give them to my my spear fellow. Oh, someone's pointing out that if I go down here, there's something called a junk bag, where if I, I think, is it right click? No, if I control click on Windows. Yeah, so what I'm doing now is I'm putting stuff in my junk bag. And this is just a big repository of items that are trash. That, and I can take them back and there's a button I can press to sell all of them at once. So, you know, if, if I was a good player, I would be reflexively putting stuff in my junk bag to sell when I get home to get all sorts of loot. I'm going to quick save because I just got a new pair of gloves and that's quality. Pro oh my god, there's monsters everywhere. Okay. Oh, I'm in a fight. Let's go fight. Oh, I should be using my disciplines. Okay, this guy still doesn't have disciplines because disciplines don't use mana. They don't they cost anything. They just um what disciplines do is they just, they have a, a reset time, they have a cooldown, and then you can use them unlimitedly. So that's a, a way in which fighting melee-wise is different. You know, magic is always more powerful than melee, but in general, most players will need a couple meat shields to keep the bad guys away, because magic users tend to end up being frail. Okay, what do I want the priest to do? I really need to get the priest a bow or some such. I don't want to waste the priest, priest's healing energy. So anyway, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have the priest hang out. And we have the mage run up. Need to get the major bow, but for now there's a bunch of fellows here. So I'm gonna start whittling them down. And here they come! There, now we have damage shield. Always eliminate the wounded one first. Now the priest can heal somebody, because I don't want to have an unlucky round where someone dies. And the mage still doesn't have a bow. I bet there were like 87 bows in the fort, and I was just lazy and didn't look for them, because. I really don't have a lot of patience when playing the game. Okay, so note the goblin ran up and attacked the healer. So 
a Vernum 3 has, our, all of our newest games have an aggro system. And one of the things about the aggro system is that if you start healing and blessing, the enemies will notice that and they'll get really angry at you because they don't like having their hard won damage be taken away. So this guy stepped past my spear dude and is trying to, trying to bonk my healer, which is rude. I'll hit the bat. And the sphere guy is gonna try to kill the goblin and misses. Unfortunate. Oh no, he's attacking the he's attacking the mage because once it, once again, mages tend to draw extra aggro because they they notice they notice spellcasters. But right now the healer can returning to town to heal is fairly quick. Oh, my mage just attacked someone with a sword. Really, really smart. Oh, now the goblin has moved forward and is pushing damage to the healer. Now this is the this is the point where the game has attained my, my has gotten my attention. Oh, okay, so the healer is still going to keep healing. And the mage is going to try to get rid of this this pest. Good. And now more another wave is coming out, but fortunately I've gotten the situation sort of under control. And I keep working on things. I'm going to run my healer up and try to take something out. Didn't work. How embarrassing. So now I have to protect the caster. Oh, wow. I need to start healing. So there are people in this, um, in this chat who have been playing my games for over 20 years now, and they are watching how bad I am at this game and, and just just rolling their eyes until they're all about to fall over backwards in their chair. I am really not good at my games. Oh, yep, he's smart enough. Oh my god, I, my healer's almost dead. What the? What the? Sam Hill. Okay. <laughs> I'm so bad at this game. Okay, the healer's gonna stumble away. So when you move disengage from an enemy, it slows down your movement. Oh, I got to find some bows. And the mage is going to is going to pace this guy. And remember, I am not playing on a high difficulty. I am playing on so this per goblin was not able to reach the healer I was trying to reach because it's slowed down. Is engaged by this warrior. Keep attacking. The healer is going to run away. Not going to heal anyone yet. The mage is just going to save spell points because I know that. Um, okay, I think I might have won. Okay, I'm gonna quick save immediately, and I'm gonna try to get items. What do we got? Still can see a bunch of skulls. Still can see. Oh, meat! Hey, oh, he's a little tiny bit damaged. I'll have him eat meat. There, now he's got some health back, and he will. I was food is useful as as a healing item early on. Later on, when you have tons and tons of hit points, you have to carry around tons of beef jerky to get healing done. But it's kind of just a bonus to help you play along quickly in the early game. I think that was everything I wanted to do here. I'm going to take a moment to look at chat. I have a question about puzzles. Some puzzles requ seem to require entering combat mode to solve, uh, but at others it seems you can cheat by... Um, i got to read that whole thing. By entering... Um, comment mode. It, am I allowed to do that with the beam ones? Okay, so I am pretty sure that every puzzle in any of my games can be solved without entering combat mode. Um, if I, I'm pretty sure my beta testers would have nagged me if that is... Um, if that wasn't the case, then I will. If that is a problem, I will be absolutely sure to fix it when I remaster Vernum Three Ruined World into Vernum Three More Ruined World, and I will do that remaster in um, twenty thirty seven. Okay, I see items on the on the ground over here. Let's see what I can get. Uh, crystals are worth money. I'll take that. Uh, I don't need a shirt. Animal skins can be sold. I'll take that. Ale. Okay, war curse for 30 to 40 turns, slow for... So drinking has an effect. It makes you wilder in combat, but it slows you down for a bit. Looking at that, it seems like if you timed it carefully, you, you could use ale as a, as, a, as a buff, which I never actually noticed before. I think that's hilarious, so I'm, I'm going to leave that in forever. That's like a that's like an elite gamer move. That that's actually really terrible because that that makes like a common item everywhere like a super powerful buff. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that alone. Our, our, the, the, 
a lot of the wonkiness in our games is actually kind of a feature. I think it is really easy to overbalance a game. I think it is really easy to look at things that are overpowered and just and purge them out, and that that is often a mistake. Uh, I think I, I feel like you know leaving bits of weird rough edges is a good thing. So I'm going to take a very brief break. I'm going to make sure. So I'm actually.